is Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1. I realize it's um, it's Christmas, but this will this Christmas season, but we'll this will tie right into the season and and uh, it'll go right along with the Sunday morning's message if you remember that out of Matthew chapter one and two. What right, the Bible says in Romans chapter one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. Well, the preacher of the good news, that's Paul. The good news, that's the theme of Romans chapter number 1 is good news. The Bible said in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, and to the Jew first and also to the, gospel, uh, to the uh, Greek. For therein, verse 17, is the righteousness of God revealed. In the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. That's the theme of Romans, Romans chapter 1, especially the gospel. So in Romans chapter number 1, we have the preacher of the gospel. And gospel means good news. So the preacher of the good news is the Apostle Paul. And you can read about the Apostle Paul, how he got saved. Uh, on, in the book of Acts, chapter number 9, he was on the road to Damascus, and the light came down from heaven, and a voice spoke. And you remember, the first question was not, what would thou have me to do? But who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? Very important, very important question. So Paul was a preacher. That, anyway, he got saved. He trusted Christ. He got saved. And as a result, we're reading... What the Holy Spirit allowed him to write, amen, and inspired him to write, uh, right here in Romans. Actually, Paul wrote the book of Romans. So he said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So not only do we see the preacher of the good news in verse number one, we see the promise of the good news in verse number two. The good news being the gospel, the promise of the gospel. So the gospel that we're hearing in Romans chapter number 1 is not a new gospel. It's an old gospel. It was in the Old Testament. It was in Genesis. And it goes all the way through all 66 books of the Bible. Isn't that what Brother David read just a while ago about in Isaiah chapter number 53 that it, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And then if you'll read Peter, it says, by his stripes ye were healed. Isaiah looking forward to Calvary, and Peter looking back at Calvary. On Calvary we were healed. And that's not physical healing, by the way. That's spiritual healing. All right, so the gospel is not a new gospel. It was in the Old Testament. So we have the promise of the good news. And it's not a new gospel. And then in verse number 3 and 4, we have the person of the gospel. The Bible said, Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of from the dead. And then in verse number five, we have the provision of the gospel. The preacher of the good news, the promise of the good news, the person of the good news is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the provision of the good news is grace and service. The provision, grace. What is grace? God's unmerited favor. God's un, I, I did not, you did not do anything to earn God's favor. That's grace. But now not only we're looking at the provision of the good news being grace, but in that same verse, in verse number five, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for what? So within that provision of the good news is service. We're created in Christ Jesus under what? Under good works. Not only is the favor of God the provision, grace a provision, but service is the provision, if you look at verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That's to be the influence. The influence that we need to be, we need to keep under our bodies, bringing them into subjection, all right? Now, the theme is the gospel of God. I hope you see that already. The gospel of God, the good news. And this good news 
originated in the love of the Father and the truth of it centers in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible said again in verse number two that the good news, the truth, has been announced in the Old Testament. But now if you'll note, and that's a parenthetical statement, verse number two. Do you see your parentheses around that in your Bible? Have you got parentheses around that verse in your Bible? Okay, so it's a parenthetical statement. Let me read verse one and verse three. The Bible said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the gospel concerns Jesus. The gospel concerns, greatly concerns, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it centers in two areas of Christ. That is, number one, his person. Number two, his work. Now, the gospel consists in the definition of who he is and in the setting forth of what he has done for us. That's the gospel. Now, suppose, let me give you a, a, an illustration. Suppose, suppose for a moment that a man owed an impossible debt, large debt, at the Regions Bank down in Milton, Florida. And another man, his friend, walks in Regions Bank on Highway 90 and says to the bank official, I want to be responsible for that debt. And then, of course, they pull up his credit rating and they find that the friend is as bankrupt as the debtor. So the gesture is meaningless. The gesture is meaningless. The value of what he promises to do depends entirely on his own position and his worth. So a mere man, and for that matter, not even an angel, nor an, a mere man nor an angel could not come to seek and to save that which is lost. Uh, what did I say before? The value of what someone promises to do depends entirely on his position, and in that case of the bank debt, wealth. And of course, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh, and he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns Regions Bank, whether they realize it or not. Amen? He, he owns everything. Now, only the Son of God, God in human flesh, could be, David, wounded for our transgression, and bruised for our iniquities. It has to be for someone to stand up and say, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And by the way, you'll find that over in Luke chapter number 19, verse number 10. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. For someone to stand up and say, I have the authority to pay their debt, pay their sin debt, then he has to be without blemish. I looked that term up, and all you have to do is type it in in your computer if you've got a Bible program. I typed that, uh, that phrase, without blemish, 94 times in the Bible that phrase is used concerning a sacrifice. If Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice, then the stage has already been set for atonement yearly in the Old Testament to be a lamb without blemish. Jesus Christ had to be without blemish. Couldn't be a mere man that could seek him to save that which is lost. Because a mere man is blemished. David said in Psalm 51, In sin did my mother conceive me. Romans chapter 3 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to say, There is none righteous, no, not, not one, not one, not one man is righteous. But now only one time in the Bible that word without blemish was used. So it's used 95 times, but only one time it was used over in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 27 concerning the church. That we are, we as the church, children of God, are to be presented faultless before the throne without blemish. So that's the only time that, with that phrase is used concerning other times it's used for sacrifice. 
for sacrifice. Now, so the Lord Jesus had to be without blemish. So we have to know, again, it just goes back to verse number three, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And we're going to get that just in a moment. Now, when Jesus came forth with his unquestionable supernatural power, they turned to him immediately with questions concerning his identity. That, now, they did the same with John the Baptist. Remember that? Who are you? Are you that prophet? And are you that, are you Messiah? And of course, John confessed that he was not the Christ. But Jesus did. Jesus confessed to who he was. He is the Christ. He and his father are one. Now, the Bible, the Bible I have found is never afraid to put the twin truths of humanity and deity of Christ in the same verse. If you look at verse 3 and 4 of our text in Romans chapter 1, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and what, verse number 4? So he was made, that's his humanity, and declared, that's his divinity. You see that? All in one phrase, or all in one verse. The humanity and the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was and Jesus is the God-man. In him is absolute humanity and absolute deity. Now, today, we say the divinity of Christ or the deity of Christ. I read that before we, the, the, just the saying the deity of Christ was popular back in the uh, late 1800s, they would not use that phrase, the deity of Christ. They would use the phrase, the divinity of Christ. And I thought, why in the world would they, because most people knew, knows what it means. So if I say, Today, from the pulpit, the deity of Christ, you understand what that means. It means that Jesus Christ is God. He's the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. He's equal with God. But I think it's coming to a point, because I have been asked that since I've been here, about what does deity mean? What, what does deity mean? It's, it's going to come to the point that we're going to have to use uh, return to the Bible phrase and, and speak of the eternal Godhead of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll look in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Did you know that God puts within man the eternal Godhead as far as knowing and can know? See, we serve one God. We serve one God. His name is Jesus. We have God the Father, God the Son, the Lord Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. We serve one God. So if we use that, if we use Bible fr uh, phrases to present who Jesus is, it might not be a problem. He is the eternal Godhead. Fact is, let me read something else to you over in the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians chapter number 2, and verse number nine, the Bible says, for in him, that is in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus Christ is eternal Godhead, the eternal Godhead of the Lord Jesus Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now in the lessons in the storm, I use this a lot. Hold your place in Romans. Go to Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8. <clears throat> in, in Luke chapter number 8, we see his humanity and his divinity. His humanity and his deity. The Bible said it came to pass in verse 18 of Luke chapter 8, uh, 
Luke chapter 8, verse 22, excuse me. Verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into his ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. What's that? What is that? His humanity or deity? His humanity. He fell asleep. He was tired. He fell asleep. As a man, he was tired. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, rebuked the wind, the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. What is that? That's deity, divinity. He commanded the elements of the universe to be quiet. That's, that's deity. And then they said, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Well, they should. He created them. Amen. Amen? He's a creator. So we see his humanity and his deity. Let me show you something else I thought was interesting. Matthew chapter 17. Everyone turn over to Matthew chapter 17. And uh, since tax season's coming up, this will settle two issues tonight. Amen? <clears throat> the tribute money. In this passage, we see humanity and deity. In, in Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 20, <clears throat> 24, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter saith, of, saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. A lot of people is taking that out of context and said, We don't have to pay taxes because the children's free. Well, Jesus Christ, is he king or is he not king? He's a king of kings and lord of lords. So, so Jesus said, to Peter, he said, do the kings pay taxes? Do the kings of the land right now pay taxes? Of course, Peter knew they didn't. And his servants didn't pay taxes. The household of the king did not pay taxes. And so, is Jesus right in paying taxes? He don't have to pay taxes. He's king. And if you're a child of the king, then you're free. And therefore, the yoke of that tax burden shouldn't be on you. But let me finish up the story. Now, we, we know that. That's context. Well, that's context. Notwithstanding, verse 27, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. So Jesus paid his taxes. Now, now, where do you see divinity? Go to the sea of Galilee that I created. I had someone drop a piece of money down there in the bottom of the sea. And I'm going to tell my creation just to go buy that coin and pick it up in his mouth. You drop your hook in, and I'm going to tell my creation to bite that hook. And when you bring that fish up, there's going to be a piece of money in his mouth. We see his humanity that he paid the taxes. We see his divinity of how he paid them. Amen? Isn't that good? We see humanity and divinity. And the Bible's not afraid to mix them together. He is, he is divine. Jesus is divine. Amen. All right, now, and then if you'll note, in chapter number one of Romans, back in our text, the Bible said, he was made of the seed of David. Made of the seed of David. We had a virgin birth. We know that Mary did not know a man. The Bible tells us that very, very clear. And it tells us how in Matthew that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and within Mary's womb planted the seed of God. Jesus was born of a woman. We have it prophesied back in Genesis chapter number 3 in verse number 15. Now, now, there is prophecy there 
uh, concerning a virgin birth. And then we have in Isaiah chapter number 7, in verse number 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and she'll bear a son, and his name's going to be what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. We find the same thing. We find it fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. That when Mary brought forth Christ, she had not known a man. She had never had any relations with a man. Jesus was born of a virgin. Therefore, Jesus did not have a sin nature like you do. He was without blemish. He did not. And how does the sin nature transfer? It's from the seed of man. Wherefore, as by one man, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You'll find that in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12. Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse 6 said, A child is born, and it goes on to say, a son is given. A child is born is what? Humanity or divinity? Humanity. A son is given. That's divinity. Right in the same verse. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. Now, hold your place in Romans just for a minute. Go over to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. The Bible says in Galatians chapter number 4, and verse 4, Galatians right after 2 Corinthians. The Bible said in verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive... The adoption of sons. Jesus died for our sins so you and I could receive that free gift and go to heaven. <clears throat> All right, now, in verse number four of Galatians chapter number four, God sent. What is that? Humanity or divinity? Divinity. Made under the law, what's that? Humanity. See, we're seeing in one, the Bible is not afraid to mention both in, in the same text. Uh, for someone to miss that Jesus is God, and how important is it to know who He is? The gospel presents it, and a man has to hear and believe the gospel before he's saved. Has to. Has to, according to the Word of God. All right, now, Romans chapter number 1, verse 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Again, in Romans chapter number one, verse number three and four, made is his humanity, uh, declared is his divinity, divinity. This is the Christ of the Bible. No other Jesus do we pay homage to or worship other than the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, someone, we was talking about that in Bible study the other day. I don't know when, the other, a couple of days ago maybe. But we looked at a text over in the book of um, 2 Corinthians. Is it possible that people today are worshiping another Jesus? I mean, let's, let's give Scripture proof on that. And I, anybody, that, anybody that knows me, and, and, and anybody that knows me, I don't get up and bash people. I just don't, it's not, I just don't do it. I, it's, it's not in my makeup to do it. But it is in my makeup to bash false doctrine. It, 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 is, in, it is in my, and Paul did it, and, and others did it. The Lord Jesus did it. Um, false, false doctrine. Doctrine that'll send you to hell. So if I, if I got up here and I preached, you need to believe on Jesus and 
then you need to get baptized in this baptistry up here to wash your sins away. Is that the Jesus of the Bible? Jesus plus anything is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus and Jesus alone, the only way to heaven. And by the way, that's why that people are offended because the gospel said it's I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know what I've figured out? I've figured out that if they can take Christ out of Christmas, Brother Chris Ively, this time of the year, then it's not going to be difficult for them to leave Christ out the rest of the year. If they can, if they can uh, uh, attempt and, 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 and succeed in this attempt to get Jesus out of Christmas, then it would be no problem taking him out anywhere else. But Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason we're here tonight. Jesus is eternal life. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, we better make sure we preach the right Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 3, But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For, verse number 4, starts with the word for. For. He that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received or another gospel which ye have not accepted ye might well bear with him. In other words, you ought, to, you ought to take note. Red flags ought to go off. You see that? Now the Bible says another Jesus and another gospel. People that are adding to the work of Christ are not preaching the same Jesus that you're hearing about tonight. The Jesus of the Bible died for your sins. God's satisfied with the payment he made and there's nothing you could do to help him get you to heaven. The only thing possible that you could ever do is believe him. And by the way, God stirs you up and gives you enough faith even to do that. If you, you, you get up, if, if you act upon that light that you have within you according to Romans 1 and, and Romans chapter 2 and you begin to seek after Christ, you know what Christ is going to do? The Lord Jesus is, is by His Holy Spirit is going is to illuminate this scripture to you. He's going to give you more truth and more truth until your understanding is opened, Luke chapter 24, and you're going to rest or believe Jesus Christ to take you to heaven. And so He gives it to you according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh how? Hearing and hearing. So our faith even comes from here. Amen? We act upon that light. God gives us the faith that we need to believe. So salvation, truly, Jonah knew what he was talking about when he said salvation is of the Lord. Amen? All right, now back to Romans here, just, and I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, no other Jesus... Do we pay homage to or worship other than the Jesus of the Bible? Now, what thank ye of Christ? You're, what thank ye of Christ? You better, you, 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 you better set up and take notice how you answer that question. What thank ye of Christ? Your answer, and people are going to judge you by your answer. And you say, well, they're not supposed to judge. Well, now that's, that's a, that is one of the most foolish statements that I've ever heard. The Bible said, ye that are spiritual, in 1 Corinthians 2.15, judgeth all things. They want to pull that Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged out of context. And, it, and, and I, you understand where that's going. You better get the beam out of your own eye for you see how to get the mote out of your brother's eye or vice versa. But, but anyway, we, we make a, I'll make a, you make a judgment. You've had to judge this preacher on what I preach. Is he telling me the truth? You had to make a judgment. All right, what thank ye of Christ? Your answer constitutes your creed. Your creed is your statement of belief. Your answer constitutes your creed. What thank ye of Christ? The value of what Jesus promised to do depends on on his position 
and his worth. He said, I can save you to the uttermost. I can make you joint heirs with myself. God's my father, heaven's my home. I can give you eternal life. He made that bold statement. Now, in order for him to fulfill that, his promise depends upon his position and his worth. Now, we said Sunday morning that Jesus has all the credentials to prove his rightful position. He fulfilled every scripture about his coming and being born in a manger, about his, about his coming. And he, by the way, is going to come again. But everything is fulfilled as to when, according to Daniel's prophecy, as to where, according to Micah's prophecy, of who he is and what he's done. It's, all, it's fulfilled. He said that he was going to make an end of transgressions in, in the book of Daniel chapter number 9. He was going to pay the sin debt for the world. It's already been prophesied years ago. Isaiah prophesied of it in Isaiah 53, David, that you read a while ago. You see, he has the credentials to prove it. If you follow his lineage and his genealogy, especially in the book of Matthew that we talked about Sunday morning, Matthew's genealogy runs through Solomon, which shows he had the right to royalty. Matthew shows his royal line. Luke runs through Solomon through Nathan, shows his legal line. Matthew, his royal line. Luke, his legal. Jesus has got the credentials. Amen. He is who he says he is. He is who he says he is. Amen. All right, let me, let me give you this right here in closing. Jesus is the legal Messiah. He's the royal Messiah. He's the true Messiah. He's the only possible Messiah. I hear people to say, well, you need to witness to Jews a little different than you witness to Christians. I wish that I could preach this message tonight to every Jew in the world. Jesus is the legal Messiah, the royal Messiah, the true Messiah, the only possible Messiah. The truth is out. The lines are exhausted. Therefore, any man that ever comes into this world professing to fulfill the conditions will be a liar and a child of the devil. An attempt's going to be made to do that. You know who's going to do that? The Antichrist. And by the way, Jesus said something about it over in John chapter 5 and verse 43. He said, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. That's going to happen. That's, that's going to happen. Now, if you're saved here tonight, and only you know that, only you and God know that, you say, can a, can a person that's saved not know they're saved? No, not on your life. If you're saved, you know you're saved. You know what Jesus Christ did for you? You remember a time. You might not remember the day or the hour, but you'll remember a time that you came to the end of yourself, that you were guilty, undone, and you're thanking God immensely for grace because of what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary. If you're saved, then you will have no problem whatsoever with Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. You'll have no problem whatsoever. You know it. You know that uh, concerning his son, the gospel is concerning his son, Jesus Christ. You, you know that you don't have a problem made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You don't have a problem with that. You don't have a problem with God becoming a man. You, you don't have that problem if you're truly saved. You don't have it. You have within you the new life, because of Christ Jesus, the very gospel. Jesus is the gospel. I, I'm through. I'm done. God bless you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> hope, hope you learned something. Let's stand our feet. We'll be dismissed. Lord bless you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Jeff, we should.